What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video if you're listening currently on itunes google pods spotify or any other streaming platform welcome in i hope you enjoy the show as always if you're checking us out on those platforms make sure you leave us a detailed review and a five star rating what's up ladies and gentlemen we are back with another great episode of our weekly podcast the sit down this is episode 119 and i'm your host Jeff Nato, it's another week, it's another show, here as we round out the summer season. It's already August, and uh, time flies and you're having fun that time of the week for another great show. And before we get into the episode today, we got a couple of news and notes to take care of, and then we're going to get into a really interesting episode. You know, uh, about a month or two ago, we did an episode on the sixth family as they were at once referred to and that was this group called the rudai organization they were albanians who muscled into territory in different areas of new york city mainly astoria queens and i had some recent questions on what am i going to do another ethnic group that ran and were around the mob today we're going to get in it's a really interesting guy um and we're actually going to get into a very famous wiretap by none other than John Gotti and his connection to today's person. We're going to talk about a guy called Spiros Valensis. Not a lot of people talk about Spiros Valensis in the eyes of organized crime, but he was very connected to the mafia and for about 20 years ran the very lucrative gambling and loan sharking rackets in Astoria, Queens. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of Greek Americans in Astoria. And we're going to get into kind of the wild life of the guy they called Spiros, um, kind of how he took over, where he comes from, the involvement of the Greek mob in Astoria, where it is today, and that infamous wiretap. It's quite interesting. Before we do everything, though, today, I want to tell you about my bookie. And look, if you've listened to the show, you viewed the show, you know all about my bookie. My bookie in current times, when we're looking at football season, which is coming up, my bookie is going to be really important, I think, to what you're doing. Uh, here on the show, we've all been there before, right? You want to go to the casino, you want to play some dice or some roulette or some, I don't know, blackjack. And you think, well, I can't get to the casino. I'm busy. My life's got uh, things going on. Well, my bookie's new and improved online casino is ready and here to change the game for you. You can dive in now to truly realistic casino experiences with live dealer action, feeling fe featuring the latest in slots, jackpots, and all sorts of other gambling games. Take advantage of their weekly blackjack tournaments and a brand new collection of high-end games for a chance at real rewards. You get a real-life Las Vegas or Atlantic City casino experience with the actions in your hands. Your adventure can start right now at My Bookie Casino and Sportsbook today with a generous sign-up bonus. When you open your account, if you use promo code SITDOWN, again, that's promo code SITDOWN, you're going to secure yourself a really, really nice bonus, a 50% match on deposits up to $1,000. That means if you put up... 500 bucks, they're going to give you 250 in deposit bonuses, and you're going to free, get a free $10 casino chip. It's important that you, like me, I've been using my bookie for a long time. Uh, and if you do, you'll get a revamp loyalty program, which ensures rewards, free spins, cashback offers, and other VIP perks. The more you play, the more you win. Be like me, be like other people here on the sit down and go check out mybookie.ag. Use promo code SITDOWN when you open your account to secure yourself a big-time bonus and a $10 casino chip. Again, mybookie.ag, promo code SITDOWN. Go check out my bookie. I greatly appreciate it, and I'm sure they will as well. You'll definitely enjoy your gambling experience. 
Let's get into the episode today. Before we get into Spiros, Valensis, and the Greek mob, I want to talk about a recent death. Just want to spend a minute or two on this. Uh, Frank Lino passed away last week at the age of 84 years old. Now, we've never done a show, at least on the podcast, about Frank Lino, though we have talked about him on our YouTube channel. In fact, we are the only known video on Frank Lino on YouTube. Now, Frank Lino was a mainstay in the Bonanno crime family for decades. And if you've ever heard of anything mafia, you've likely heard the name Lino. And this is not to be confused with Frankie Lino or Robert Lino, um, but they were all related, whether they were cousins or whatnot. Frank Lino was a really powerful guy in the Bonanno crime family. In fact, he would been a, become a cop of regime and he would actually be one of the people that pushed for Tommy Karate Patera to be made. Uh, he was an associate Patera of Frank Lino's crew for a long time. They were both Brooklyn guys. Frank Lino came up in a street gang called the Avenue U Boys. It was actually at one point rumors that he was involved with the murder of a police officer, but he was never actually tried for it. And Frank Lino is most known for... Uh, being involved the day of the three capos hit, he drove Sonny Red, Alphonse, or, or Sonny Red, uh, Philip Giancone, and Dominic Trinchera to the meeting with Joey Messino and all the hitters. And Lino escaped with his life. He probably should have died that day, but he quickly kind of got down with the Bonato family. And it would eventually become very connected to Joey Messino. They were very trusted confidants together. And Lino operated for a long period of time as a cop of regime, really successful guy, really um, kind of made a lot of waves in Brooklyn, got a lot of respect. Um, I actually was told a pretty interesting story by Mikey Scars about Frank Lino, uh, about when Mikey Scars was a kid. Um, I don't know that I'll tell it. I'll let him tell it at some point. Why don't you guys go ask him about it? Say, uh, Jeff Nadeau mentioned a story about when you were young and you had a run in with Frank Lino. RJ told me about it. It was a pretty cool story. I'll let him tell you about it. Go to his uh, Patreon and, and bother him about it. Um, it's a pretty cool story, actually. Mikey uh, Scars had a, a pretty cool run in with him. So, um, yeah, he passed away last week. He was not in witness protection. Um, he was actually just living pretty openly in New Jersey. Um, and someone that is very close to the family reached out to me and provided me the info that he had passed away. Um, Frank would ultimately cooperate with the federal government, uh, in the late nineties. He was, um, he was arrested. He was given a, uh, prison sentence. Um, and I think once he learned that Sal Vitale would turn informant, you know, Lino kind of, uh, kind of knew the writing was on the wall. He had already been serving about five years and he knew that the testimony that Vitale was going to give to him and about him was going to be his death nail. So Lino decided to cooperate. And look, um, we know, I mean, a lot of people cooperated uh, in the end. Um, at one point, Lino would tell investigators that um, he knew about some sort of meeting and that the meeting that Vitali had with the police was essentially his funeral and that he was dead. He would then get word to prosecutors that he wanted to flip as well. Um, and, and he would tell the government that he worried that Messino would actually go after his family and his children, uh, which we know probably wouldn't have happened, but that's the reason Lino gave uh, to what happened. Um, so really for the last 20 plus years, Lino lived kind of an open life uh, down in Howell, New Jersey. Uh, he was 84 at the time of his death. Let's get into today's episode. Uh, we always get into a biography quite quick. I don't do much news anymore. Um, and, and for anyone that I, I wanted to address this quickly, for anyone that's watching us currently on YouTube, um, understand that this is actually started as our podcast. And every Wednesday I put out a podcast. We only recently started putting them on YouTube. So when you hear me kind of go into some other things, this is our weekly show, right? It's a little different than our Saturday episode where we just get right into something on YouTube. Um, but I like to have some different needles uh, in the haystack, if you will. So. Let's get into the very interesting life of Spiros Valensis on the sit down. I want to, before we get into Spiros's life, I want to kind of talk about the area of Astoria in Queens because, according to 
many reports and historical information other than Melbourne, Australia. Astoria is the second largest Greek community in the world outside of obviously Greece. So it's a huge area for Greeks. And Greeks have really been coming to Astoria for hundreds of years. Um, they're actually the first known Greek individual to come to the United States or this continent was way back in the 1500s. But Greeks really started coming to New York um, in and around the 50s. Um, as of 2010, there were about 1.3 million Greeks in the United States. And that number is probably, we haven't gotten the numbers recently, but that number is probably closer to 2 million by this point. And as I said, in the 50s and 60s, Greeks were coming to Astoria. Um, and as of 2016, there are 165,000 people in Astoria. Over 10% are actually Greek. So again, that's like nearly 20,000 people in one little area that are Greek. Now, from what I understand, one of the main reasons that Greeks came to Astoria was one, it's close connection to Manhattan. You could be in Manhattan in 10 to 15 minutes, depending on traffic and where you were in Astoria. And it was also said that Greek people really liked Astoria due to the fact that they were close to Manhattan, but didn't need to deal with the big buildings. As we know in Greece, and this is uh, Athens, a part of Athens, there are no like skyscrapers, right? And that's something that the Greek people really liked about Astoria. And they just happened to settle there. So there's kind of a rich history. And if you go there today, I mean, it's still very Greek, right? You'll see um, restaurants and clubs and 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 all sorts of cafes uh, in Astoria. And it is still very Greek dominated. Now for Spiros Valensas, he was born in December of 1932. And he hails from the neighborhood of Neos Cosmos in Athens, Greece, um, by the age of 14, really in the late 40s, Spiros Valensis' family would emigrate to the United States. Now, they would first settle in Boston, Massachusetts, which was an area that a lot of Greeks were going to as well. And in Boston, Spiros' family uh, in the early 50s owned a small cafe, like a tavern type of place in Boston. They would quickly sell that, though, and move to Astoria, Queens. Now, in Queens, Spiros' father would again open a small cafe, luncheonette type place uh, in Astoria. Now, as we know, right, if you go to where I live in, you know, residential suburb of Philadelphia, if you go to South Jersey, if you go to Detroit, Chicago, wherever, wherever you go, you're likely to stumble upon. New Jersey, even a diner. Okay. A lot of diners are owned by Greeks. In fact, one of the places I go out every weekend in Lancaster and PA uh, is own, owned by Greeks. They've owned it for 35 years. Um, Greeks have always been involved with the restaurant business. I know many Greeks that own restaurants. They're all diners, they're all bar, like nice little restaurants. They're big into that service industry. And it's no secret that Spiros's family was as well. But it was realized pretty quickly by the late 50s that Spiros did not want to be a restaurateur. And that's not to say he didn't own restaurants and taverns and cafes and bars, but Spiros wanted more. And in his 20s, once he's in New York, he starts obviously running around you know, with other Greeks uh, because that's all there was in a story at that time. And Spiros starts to become kind of involved a little bit in the community. It was said that he would start out in the early 60s as a driver for a person called Peter Caracas. Now, Caracas, back in the 50s and 60s and really into the 70s, was essentially the creator of the Greek mob in a story. He ran all the rackets, everything from loan sharking, you know, dice games, poker, um, horse parlors, uh, anything gambling related and racket related, Spiros ran or Caracas ran and Spiros was involved with him. He was his driver. 
So Spiros is learning from Caracas, who's this old school mob guy, right? And remember, in these ethnic communities, whether it's Italian communities, Albanian communities, Russian communities, Greek communities, even Spanish, black communities, there's a certain subset of criminality. And back then it was numbers, loan sharking, gambling. Everyone likes to do these sorts of things. We talked about this when we talked about Spanish Raymond Marquez a couple of weeks ago on YouTube. The need in a lot of these ethnic communities, they like to gamble. And a lot of Peter Caracas's early influence, and we thank Button Guys, uh, which is um, NewYorkMafia.com. We thank them for this photo. That was the only known photo I'd found on Peter. And Peter ran the illegal rackets. Now, Caracas was also said to be involved, if you look into his arrest, in heroin as well, uh, which, look, once you start moving around in certain illegal operations, you start getting involved in other things. And what this does is, in any community that's organized, mob-wise, they take that and put it into legit businesses. So Spiros is learning under a pretty powerful guy in the Greek community. And one of the main things that all the Greek communities were involved in was a game called Barboot. Uh, Barboot is a, a dice game that is very known in the Balkans. Uh, and when I say the Balkans, I mean, um, you know, Albania, Croatia, you know, Greece, Bulgaria, um, you know, modern day Yugoslavia. Now, I'm not going to go into what Barboot is. This is not a, a gambling show, but it's essentially a, a dice game. Um, it's a um, something that that is went back years um, and you play with two dice and you try to capture certain combinations. Um, you know, it's no different than any other dice game, really. So the most of the money coming in was through clubs like this with Barboot and poker and horses and all sorts of different things. Now, early on, when the Greek mob was kind of just starting to, to kind of go and Caracas had owned it, he would make a deal with someone called Christy Tick Funari, who we know of as a very powerful individual in the Lucchese crime family. And what Christy Tick does, and it's very smart, is he goes to Pete Caracas and says, okay, man, this is your neighborhood. It's all your people. We own Astoria. We own Queens, these parts of Queens. And look, if you look into Tony Ducks, you know, you look into Vincent Papa, who was in the Lucchese family. He was based, Vincent Papa, in Astoria. The, 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 Involvement of not only the Gambinos, but the Lucchese's in Astoria has always been really, fairly documented. Now, we'll get into Christy Tick, because if you know anything also about Greeks, there was a large Greek population in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and Diker Heights, which Christy Tick was from. So that's the connection. So Pete um, Caracas back then kind of makes this deal with Christy Tick and says, look, we're going to operate here. But Christy Tick says, okay but you're going to kick up to us. We ultimately own this area and we'll let you operate freely, but you got to kick us 10 K a month. And that was the deal. So they're, they're kicking up about 120 K a year. Now this is back in the sixties, right? And I'm sure that went up over the years, but it was a pretty good operation because they were making tons of money, the Greeks, but the mafia was always at the top level. And again, when we talk about like the numbers racket in Harlem, with Spanish Raymond or someone like that, he was ultimately kicking up to Fat Tony, who was in the Genovese family. So the mafia was always the end game. Okay? You weren't going to operate. Look, if you were selling drugs, you know, in Harlem, black guys, they're kicking up to, to the mob. Like, that's just how it is. You know, the gas tax scheme. That was a Russian-led thing, but it was shared with the mob. All this stuff, and this is why the mob is so powerful. And this is just one subset of that community. Now, as I said, Astoria and Bay Ridge were high-level Greek areas. And particularly in Astoria, there had always been mob presence. As I mentioned, the Lucchese family was there with people like Vincent Papa. The Gambino crime family was based there, one of which was Joanne Gallo. Joanne Gallo had a, a luncheonette and social club in the area of Crescent Street and 30th Avenue in Astoria. And Joanne Gallo was very powerful in the Gambino crime family. He was the longtime consigliere for the family. And goes through many different regimes, even into the Gotti years, which we'll get into that connection with the Greeks here. Now, by the early 70s, P. Caracas passes away. And his number two is Spiros. Spiros had worked his way up from a driver 
to being a guy who was pretty dependable. He knew the people of Astoria. They respected him. I was told at one point when I was researching Spiros, a source in Queens who knows everyone, a source that I've gotten a lot of good information from and would know. He told me that Spiros was, to the Greek people, Robin Hood. He did everything for Greek people. If you needed something, Spiros was the guy. And I relate him to, I was told, he was like Sonny, basically, in a Bronx tale. If you needed something, you went to Sonny. And that's the easiest way to describe Spiros, because a story is not a huge area. But for Greeks, it was huge. And Spiros was a very rich man. Because he ran not only illegal enterprises, but he was running other things too. He had restaurants. He had travel agencies. He was the chamber of commerce for Greek people. And as I said, there are tens of thousands of Greeks. That's a lot of people. That's a way to make a really good living for yourself. Now, he had many underlings under him. Um, a lot of people in the Greek community he had about 30 people, which, again, not a huge operation. But didn't need to be. They ran shit in Astoria and in parts of Diker Heights. And it was good because they were protected by the Lucchese family. They went through the proper channels. They made the right relationships. At one point, Spiros would say that he was paying, again, about one twenty dollars to $150,000 a year to the Lucchese crime family to operate. Now, Spears would also talk about the fact that they made a lot of money through loan sharking too, right? Because that's every gambler's problem. They run out of money and they need to borrow, so they go to a loan shark and they're paying exorbitant high interest rates on loans. It all means big money, dinero, scratch, chicken. Plus, Spears had legit stuff. Now, Spears should say at one point, quote, we all grew up together. Everyone knew me. I knew everyone. I was the boss in Astoria. Now, when he says he was the boss, he meant he was almost like the Chamber of Commerce president. You needed a job. Spears would get it for you. Some low-level thief was bothering you. Spears would deal with it. He wasn't looked at as a criminal. And let's be honest. He really wasn't. He was running rackets. Everybody gambles. Everybody plays the horses or runs and plays barboot. And things are quiet in Astoria. That's why they liked Spiros Valensis. Now, by this point, obviously, he's still dealing with the Lucchese family. He's not dealing directly with Christy Tick. Christy Tick had obviously made his way up in the Lucchese family. Initially, Spiros Valensis was dealing with Anthony Gaspipe Castle, who was an underling of Christy Tick, he would then begin dealing with Peter Fat Pete Chiodo. Now, we've talked about both of these individuals at length. Fat Pete was a huge earner in the uh, Lucchese family. He was involved with all sorts of rackets. He would get jammed up in that Windows case, made a ton of money. I mean, lived at a huge home on Staten Island. Fat Pete was involved with, with everything. Uh, and he was a conduit to the Lucchese family for Spiros. So anything that was dealt with, if he needed, he would pick up the money, right? He was handling all that stuff. And if Spiros had a problem, he would go to Fat Pete. Now, at one point, that was a good relationship to have. But down the road, as we know, once we get into the late 80s, into the early 90s, relationships with Fat Peter would not be good if you were in the criminal world. Things were good for Spiros. He would move his family out of his power base of business in Astoria to the area of Whitestone. Now, he would live in Whitestone as well as Bayside, Queens, a pretty bucolic area uh, near the water, just kind of a nice residential spot uh, in, um, in that area. Now, from what I understand, his family still lives in those areas today, uh, his children and people like that. So... Uh, Spiros kind of carved out his own uh, American dream, if you will. Now, I want to go to the fact that, like I, like I said, Spiros was good. Everything was fine. But as we know in the mob and organized crime, if you get a little too close to other people, there could be a problem. Now, the mob handled it through sit-downs and, like, mediation. But sometimes you 
say things you shouldn't say. And this is where the connection to John Gotti pops up. One of the most famous wiretaps that John Gotti is known for is, I, me, John Gotti, will sever your motherfucking head off, you cocksucker. We've all heard that, right? That's a really known tap. The other most famous one is probably, uh, it's going to be in a Cosa Nostra. You know that that one? But they've recorded John Gotti saying all sorts of things. But for a long period of time, you heard that, right? I'll sever your motherfucking head off. And that really kind of illustrated that you know, John Gotti was this you know, dapper guy. He's in the streets. He's videotaped and photographed. And he looks like this, like, you know, guy. But he also was pretty depraved, right? Saying things like that. I'll sever your head off. And that's depraved. Um, but Gotti, we wondered who he was saying that about. You know, was it an underling? Was it? Someone he was annoyed with. And, and this wasn't the first time Gotti said stuff like this. He at one point told Big Tony Moscatello that he was going to blow his, you know, residence up. I mean, he, he said a lot of things on the phone that he shouldn't have said. He didn't know he was being recorded. Probably should have known that. But he was actually talking about Spiros Valensis. Now, I had to dig deep for this because I had wondered, why would he say that about Spiros? And who is he saying it to? Because he wasn't saying it directly to Spiros. You can tell he's being recorded and talking to someone else. Now, I'm not going to quote him exactly, but I asked Mikey Scars about this. RJ got me connected, and I asked Mikey Scars, who was John Gotti blowing off steam to about Spiros? Now, according to him, he believed that he was talking to Patsy Conti. Now, if you know anything about Patsy, Patsy ran large parts of Queens and Long Island and that Patsy had went to John about this Spiros and that he was getting a little too close to some of their gambling operations, which maybe Joanne Gallo had a part of as well. Now, Joanne Gallo, by this point, pretty old guy. So maybe Conti was like, hey, you know, this fucking guy's encroaching on our territory. And Gotti just went off and, and, and said it about him. Now, Mikey Scars said it wasn't more to Spiros that he was saying it to, but he was just kind of irritated that they were bringing this to him. Like, why are you bringing this to me? You just tell him this, you know? Like, he was just, I think, more annoyed at them for bringing this to him and why they just didn't handle it on them, them, there on their own. Um, but luckily for Spiros, no one did anything to him from the Gambino family, which I'm sure he was close to. Um, happening, but it never actually did. But that's where the quote sever, you know, comes from. Uh, it was about Spiros. I mean, and to be honest, if we're being real, this guy might be a little annoying. I mean, be honest, look at that guy. I mean, he looks just like a, a little pest weasel, a kind of, uh, you know, but you know, from all uncommon purposes, I mean, from whoever one I talked to, um, Spiros was, was really respected. Now, by 1988, um, you know, things are pretty much operating good for Spiros. I mean, he has his connections to the Lucchese's. He's still making a lot of money. And this is almost 20 years he's running operations for as kind of the head of the Greek mob, uh, if we call them that. They're called the Valensis organization. But, you know, they're a power in, in certain parts of Brooklyn and, and in Queens. But Spiros would have a problem of his own. Um, by 1988, it's said that another person is starting to, and this is questioned on what actually happened here, but there's rumors that this guy, Sriracho, Sammy the Arab, Nalo, is starting to muscle into Queens and into Astoria. Now, Nalo is, in his own right, a pretty interesting dude. Uh, Nalo would come over to the United States from Iraq in the 70s and would actually settle in Detroit. Uh, Scott Bernstein actually had reported that. If you know anything about Detroit, they have a large Iraqi popula population, Chaldean. Um, and Scott said they actually was where Nala went initially. He would then link up with a Rochester, New York area mobster. And Nala and him started running burglary gangs. Uh, and they're actually known, Nalo and his crew, they were actually at one point backed by Christy Tick. They were the group in 1972 that actually robbed 
The Pierre Hotel. Uh, this is a great book by Iowa Burkow on the Pierre Hotel robbery. Um, they would make off with millions of dollars in jewelry and other things from safe deposit boxes in the Pierre Hotel. So Nalo was a pretty notorious criminal, and he would take a lot of the money that he earned. He actually would open a club in Manhattan uh, on um, Hudson. I mean, it's on Hudson Street now, but I believe back then it was on uh, 26th Street. Um, called Port Syed. Uh, it was a pretty known uh, nightclub. A lot of people liked it. Gangsters went there a lot, celebrities. So Nalu was kind of becoming a bit of a you know businessman. He made a lot of money illegally, but he also owned some gambling clubs and he started kind of encroaching on Astoria. And that's what, you know, Spiros believes. There's also rumors though, that it wasn't necessarily because of that, this actually murder was approved by Casso and Amuso, and it would be one of the murders they were credited for. There's a lot of rumor that it wasn't encroaching on territory with Spiros, but that Nalo actually had owed fat Peter Chiodo $100,000. He was not paying the debt. Now, Spiros is involved with this for one reason. In and around October 25th, 1988, Spiros has a travel agency in Astoria. He is not there that day. Nalo is told to come to the travel agency to talk to Spiros on the phone. At that point, Spiros and him are chatting. Two gunmen, Richie the Toupee, Pagliarulo, and Mike Baldi, Mike Spinelli walk in and shoot Nalo multiple times. Now, as Nalo is on the floor dying from gunshot wounds, he allegedly tells responding officers that it was Spiros. Spiros set him up. And it would probably prove that he may have. I mean, the Fed said he lured Nalo to the agency to be killed. Now, we'll get into what Spiros says about this and what would ultimately happen. But this was a big thing. Now, what do I believe happened? I think probably if I know what I know about Spiros, a story was his area. It was the Lucchese's area. He probably went through Chiodo. And Chiodo was just like, you know what? This motherfucker owes me money too. So yeah, he's an asshole. And they went to Amusa and Castle and said, look, this guy is bothering us. He needs to go. And, you know, this Nalo was a criminal. You know, he was a... He was not just any low level guy. He was, he made a lot of money and, and burglary and things like that. And you know, he had some money behind him. He looked, was probably looked at as a, as an interloper and they wanted him dead. Now, do I believe Sparrows lured him there? Probably. I don't know. Now to this day, Spiros says, quote, he had nothing to do with the murder. Now, I also will say this about Spiros and this whole thing. Spiros would say at one point that kind of why does he believe that this was said? Spiros would say, quote, for six months, I wondered why Sammy the Arab would say I was involved. I guess at the time he believed I'd set him up because no one knew we would meet except me. So was Nalo being surveilled and he was just followed or did Spiros actually do it? He maintained his innocence. Now, for Spiros Valensis, in 1992, things would all end. He, along with multiple associates, would be indicted by the federal government on loan sharking, gambling, and murder charges in a wide-ranging set of charges. Now, initially, he believed, hey, I'll plead maybe, I'll get something on this, and I'll get out at some point. Problem was as Spiros is, and most of these old guys are, they don't want to take deals. They believe they can beat it. There's nothing here. And Spiros declines 12 years. Says no. Problem was, as I said earlier, when you make certain relationships in the mafia, you have to flip a coin on, are those people going to stand tall? As we know, fat Peter Chiotto did not stand tall. 
uh, due to the fact that he was shot 12 times and they tried to kill his sister. Fat Peter Chiodo will cooperate with the federal government. And guess what? They were given testimony that Spiros was involved in the murder of Sammy the Arab Nalo. So this was really problematic for Spiros. He also had turned down 12 years. Spiros Valensis was ultimately convicted and sentenced to life in prison. As I said, he would actually appeal. They would fail. And in 1994, while in prison at USP Terra Hut in Indiana, Jerry Capisci would actually speak to Sparrows. And that's where he would say that he had, quote, nothing to do with the murder of Sammy Nalo. Now, Spiros would also maintain the fact that he was the boss. He had run rackets for a long time, but that he shouldn't be doing life in prison for just maybe making a phone call. He wasn't directly involved with the murder. He didn't pull the trigger. Uh, and yeah, he was probably guilty of being a you know racket boss, if you will. But that was just for the people of Queens. They loved him. He was a Robin Hood. And look, as I said, the source that I spoke to, that's the maintained thought. I'm sure if you go to Astoria today and you sit down with some 85-year-old Greek guy, he'll probably tell you good things about Spiros. Spiros probably did a lot of things for people. That said, he's also doing a lot of illegal things. But was he out, you know, killing people regularly? No. In fact, there are no known murders that he was involved in other than the fact that he may have set up Sammy the Arab Nalo. Now, as I said, Spiros would ultimately try to get out. Uh, he would try to get uh, appeals, things of that nature. Uh, in 2022, through his attorney, Gerard Maroney, um, he would uh, try to convince the Second Circuit Court of Appeal that he was wrongfully convicted. And then in 2022, he would file a compassionate release. Now, his lawyer would argue that he has multiple uh, ailments, including uh, arthritis, hyperthyroidism, glaucoma, hypertension, diverticulitis, kidney disease, and cognitive impairment that leaves him disoriented. So he had all sorts of medical problems, which you know, sadly you get when you get older. Now, his lawyer would also try to say that the initial determination back in 1992, that 12 years enough would have been enough punishment and that are extraordinary and compelling reasons as to why he should be released. His attorney, Gerard Marone, would say, quote, Mr. Valensis does not deserve to die in prison. And then he just really wanted to live out the rest of his life with his family and try to get better medical care. There's one thing we could say about federal prison. We know there is no good medical care. And you're basically just in a really tough spot. Let's just be honest. 31 years later, as we speak, Sparrows is still in federal prison. He is currently incarcerated at FCI Allenwood, which I'm just going to be real, is not a medical prison. He's not a Coleman. He's not a Butner. He's not a Devins. He's at a regular institution. Got to admit, pretty hardcore for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Spiros is lambing and doing his thing and will probably never get out of federal prison. He is currently 88 years old. So his time and days are numbered, we could probably imagine. 88, it's a good life. When he looks back, and I'm sure he does regularly, he's come a long way, you know, from the, you know, neighborhoods of Athens, comes to America, has a little success, but once more, rises all the way to the top of his people, the Greek mob in Astoria, has some pretty interesting interactions, made a lot of money. I'm sure he set up his family for a lifetime. And Spiros is old school. I'm sure he doesn't want to be in prison, but he realizes this is the end for me. This is where it goes. And this is what I find so interesting about these people. I'm sure Spiros could cooperate. I'm sure he could say, hey, it wasn't me. In fact, I'll give you other things. He could have did that, I'm sure, but he didn't. And that's just what these old guys have that a lot of these young guys don't. They have the wherewithal to realize they are criminals, and this is all that it is for them. This is the end. Spirits will likely die a death that will not be reported, other than people like me, because this is what we do. 
But other than me, people have pretty much forgotten about him. A story has changed completely. It's still Greek, but it's not like it once was. It's a pretty trendy area to live now due to its connections to Manhattan and how close it is. We would also learn that in the 90s and 2000s, which I'm going to put the episode at the end of this show, I highly urge you, check out the next chapter of this story involving the Rudai organization, Albanians who attempt to muscle in on the territory that was once Spiros Valensis. A person called Photius de Malopoulos takes over uh, certain rackets and he gets muscled. Um, Antonio Balampanis is another guy. They kind of start getting muscled out and the Albanians try to muscle in. So I urge you to check that out. Uh, that'll be at the end of this video. Um, you can also check it out on YouTube. We also did a podcast about it as well. So it's all there. Check it out. It's kind of a good next chapter in this story. But a guy that I wanted to talk about, I think is a pretty cool topic to get into. Um, and uh, he lived a pretty interesting life. And is the guy behind the sever your, you know, blank off conversation involving Gotti. So there's a name to the, the quote now. I hope you all have a great week. I hope you uh, enjoyed the show today. As always, as I always say, make sure you give us some love, show us some love, hit that like button. If you're on YouTube, you know, give us a review. If you're listening to us on iTunes or something, the biggest thing I could also tell you, tell your friends, tell someone you might enjoy the show. That's how we grow. That's how we've been able to grow to where we are. Um, if you have a, a grandpa or an uncle or, or a friend that might like it, tell them about it. Share us. Hit the subscribe button on their phone. It really means a lot to our show. And I really appreciate everyone that's involved with us weekly. All the commenters, all the people that send me DMs on Twitter, anyone that's followed us on TikTok at the Sit Down Crime Pod. Uh, I am so overwhelmed with how well we've done here. And I'm so proud of it. So I got some really cool things coming up. I secured a huge interview uh, we're going to be doing towards the end of August. Um, we're going to be speaking to someone that no one has ever spoken to that was connected to the mafia for a very long time. Um, and I'm really excited about that. No, it's not Joe Messino. So please don't ask. It's not Phil Leonetti, who people have already talked to. This is someone you're never going to guess. But I promise it's going to be a great great show. I also will tell you guys, if you want some more content, check out me and Dom Sakali on Patreon. We're doing a Patreon about the life of him. Patreon.com slash the life of Dom Sakali. It's a pretty cool look into some things you probably haven't heard before. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.